Guitar practice session 10 4, 24. These are fairly sloppy practice sessions where I practice whatever I think I need to be working on, hoping the practice sessions help me to generate a routine, verbalize what I'm working on to get it in my mind better, possibly provide information to others working on similar things, possibly also providing for feedback if people see a better way to do the things that I'm trying to be doing here. Practice session could be a little bit different than what you're used to with other guitar practice sessions because we're going to be using an Excel worksheet trying to orientate the Excel worksheet to make it as easily to visualize the fretboard as possible from the perspective of playing the guitar behind the guitar where you have the top string on top followed by the strings underneath it from left to right which if you implanted on the screen here would give you the top string on top and then top to bottom left to right in the same perspective as you behind the guitar. I will also flip my guitar around so it looks like I'm left handed so that you can kind of imagine it's your fingers on the guitar from behind the guitar and try to visualize all three at the same time. Your guitar, my guitar, and the fretboard uh, in terms of the worksheet all going the same way. So we are this time going to be working on the minor scale or Ionian, uh, Aeolian mode, which I'm going to call mode number six, which we will discuss. We'll discuss the relative positions. We'll talk about the relative modes. We'll take a look at the intervals. We'll take a look at the notes in the scale. We'll talk about what I call mode or shape number four. And then we'll talk about what it means to be shape number four and different naming conventions. We'll talk about breaking the shapes inside of this shape to a three note, uh, two note pentatonic shape or a three string, I'm sorry, a, a three string, two string pentatonic type breakout to a two string, two string, one string, which I would call a seven note house analogy breakout. So we'll discuss why that might be useful why it's useful to look at relative positions and how those can basically help if we're moving from key to key rather than spending so much time learning the actual notes because on the guitar everything is shiftable so if we can learn the relative positions then we can basically theoretically at least move the shapes around uh, the neck. So then we'll take that concept and before we talk about the intervals I'm going to go into other ways that we can view the fretboard so we can try to piece together in our mind the, the analogies that we're using here, which can also be applied even if we're doing the scales differently, such as I would call the two note per string shape or a lean back shape. This would be basically taking every note that is in the scale on the top string, constructing a three note chord from it, whether that be a major or minor chord, the one, three, five of the major scale being major, the two, three, six being minor, the seven being diminished. And then we can kind of connect these two, two together and we get our scale. So an, if we make a chord then from a, uh, a, in this case, a minor leaning back and then the B and then the B, which would be the Locrian leaning back and connect them we get our scale so it should be a b c d e f and then we can continue on from there i've talked about this as it relates to our analogy of the seven note house analogy so that we can kind of combine those two concepts they're not two distinct things that we have to keep in separate areas of our mind but are instead two things that we should be able to blend together and switching our view simply switching our perspective to one or the other, allowing us possibly to navigate through these positions. So we'll start up top actually with the major or C shape and discuss it and then think about how it runs through our, our shapes. These shapes are the actual five uh, breakout shapes that we're typically working on and see how this relates to it and how we can apply the rules of the shapes that we build to these rules and see what the difference are, reconcile the differences. And then we'll go, we'll do the same thing with the D, which is the Dorian. And then we'll go to the E, uh, which is the Phrygian. And then we'll go to the F, which we can move up here now and start to see it generating on this side, uh, the F. And then we'll go to the G, which is uh, the Mixolydian, and then back to the A. 
Then we'll also look at the three note per string shapes and do the same kind of idea and say, look, I'm starting at the same point as our house analogy and just changing the rules a little bit to always do three note per strings and never have that, that two note per string thing. What does that do? It tends to make us move forward. So we'll run through these shapes and try to see how they relate to what we're learning in one position so that we can kind of switch our mind to say, okay, I see that we're, now we're in what I would call position number two and now we're in position number three and this three note per string shape actually straddles the two of them due to the, to the different convention that we're using and we'll reconcile that convention. What are the rules that we're doing in, in this one shape to stay in one column versus the rules that we are applying here? How can I see the differences so that I can easily maneuver between the two methods of playing the scales and then think about when those two methods might be applicable. So we do the same for the Dorian. And then again, we move to the, to the Phrygian starting on the E. Then we move back here to get to the Lydian. And then we'll go to uh, the Mixolydian. And then we'll go to the Aeolian. Once again, just playing through the modes nice and easily by starting on that top point. All right, and then and then we'll go back on over here and we'll take a, we'll tell a joke at that point. It was a, a rant, a very long rant on on movies and stuff, which might annoy some people, but that's my that's my practice session. It's my ranting practice session. And then we'll go into the intervals at the bottom of the shape and map out the intervals around here back to the top, uh, thinking about the intervals related to the minor, thinking about the related modes and where they live. Uh, in these shapes uh, so that we can then be able hopefully to orientate ourselves more clearly uh, on uh, the fretboard. And then I end off trying to play different combinations. These are these are chord combinations and noodling around with, with different combinations and picking them and then practicing playing them in one place to across the fretboard. I also play a little bit with the idea of taking these three chords and then adding a secondary dominant, meaning if I want to make the, the four chord a destination, I play the, the fifth of it and lead into that chord, right? And then if I want to make the fifth the destination, so that's a common strategy. So we'll kind of tinker with that a little bit uh, at the end, a little tired. I kind of messed up. Hopefully I didn't confuse anyone with that because I, I made an error, I think, but I'm going to leave it there. And that's it. Continuing on with what I would call shape number four, looking at what I would call mode number six, that being the Aeolian mode, remembering that I'm using an absolute mode numbering system based on the major scale, the major mode, the Ionian mode as the first. So if the major scale or Ionian mode is the one, then the sixth mode of it would be the Aeolian mode or minor scale. So we're looking at the minor scale or Aeolian mode, which I'm calling mode number six. We're looking at the relative positions listed on uh, the left, the first through the seventh positions. We have the notes here related to those positions. So we are in then the key of A minor or A uh, Aeolian, A mode six Aeolian, right? And then we're gonna have the list of the related modes but using a numbering system not based on the relative positions, but on the absolute numbering system based on the major scale or Ionian mode, helping to orientate us like we do in the universe. For example, from a physics perspective, we have to measure from some point uh, to try to orientate ourselves in terms of where we are. Then we're gonna look at the intervals here, remembering that in the minor uh, key, we wanna basically memorize those, those intervals because we can compare then the minor key to the other relative minor modes, which would be the Phrygian mode and uh, the Dorian mode. So in terms of these intervals, it's useful to remember, I believe in order of first the major scale, which is somewhat easy because you only have perfects and majors within it in terms of the interval structures. And then we wanna memorize the minor scale as it relates to the major scale, which is somewhat easy because the perfects are the same. And then there's uh, where all the majors were, we replaced them with minors, except for the minor second, which still has a major second in the main minor mode. Uh, and so that's what we basically want to be memorizing, not only the 
uh, positions here, like a minor third and a major second and so on, but also the intervals. And so that's what I've added here so I can see the actual number of notes that we're counting because that's the actual distance that we're talking about. So that's useful to kind of repeat in our mind, although it takes a little bit more time to do so. Otherwise, we're learning shapes without really understanding the deeper meaning of that means how many steps in terms of units. Like, like that would be kind of like talking about a, a ruler, but you named every, every combination of inches on the ruler and you called it like a minor third, but you don't know how many inches that actually is, right? You see how that, you lose some of the, you lose some of the application if you don't understand what like a three inch distance means in terms of the base scale of inches, which is the same thing happens here if I, if I use a minor third and I lose the fact that I don't realize how many actual half tones or half steps are within it, then I kind of, I'm losing some of the meaning, which is gonna lose application. Okay, so that's, that's gonna be what we do. So we're gonna have a perfect first, a, a major second, a major, a three note away, minor third, a five note away, perfect fourth, a seven note away, perfect fifth, an eight note away, minor six, a 10 note away, minor seven. Now we're gonna be working once again on what I call shape number four. I call it generically shape number four like many people do because if you started on this as your shape number one, this is just the top string. This would be shape number two. This would be shape number three then. And this would be shape number four. Somewhat of a generic numbering system, but many people use it and the genericity actually makes sense in a similar way as coming up with a, an absolute numbering system for the modes instead of keeping on trying to change the numbering system in your mind as you go around a circle because again you can't orientate yourself like trying to orientate yourself in space but you but you you, you don't want to call any position special so you can't pick a measuring point right you have to pick a measuring point if you want to start to measure anything <laughs> Everything is relative, I get it, but you gotta, you gotta start somewhere, right? This is the kind of idea, I feel like. But some people will also name this after the caged system, which means that if I look at the relative major, which is gonna be the C, and then I construct a key on it, I'm gonna do it out here because it's easier to make a chord in open position, which is also in position four, but a little bit more difficult or different to finger, possibly easier, but more complex in some ways to visualize because our fingers are moved up but if i make a lean back chord that's a c shape and so if i move that up here that's why we would call that a c position remembering that if you use the caged system to name your shapes you're taking a three note chord building on top of it a five note pentatonic in which case the three note will spit will fit uniquely into a five note pentatonic and then you're adding the added two notes. If you try to fit the three note chord into a seven note scale, it will fit in more than just one place, which is gonna defeat the purpose. So it's great to use that method, but again, you kinda wanna have an idea of what you're, you know, exactly what you're doing. Otherwise you're gonna say, hey, that C fits into this shape and the, therefore this shape must be like the equivalent of shape number four, but it's not because you use seven notes instead of a five note pentatonic so you have to, that's what's gonna be the problem. So that if anybody's having that problem, I've had that problem before, then that's probably, you might wanna look at that. See, that might be the thing that helps you out there. Okay, so then you also might call it, like name it by the starting note. If I started at the top, it'd be Phrygian, because if I played this through from the top, it would be playing a Phrygian shape which is a minor mode, has a distinctive, you can tell because it has these two starting points. That means whenever you have a shape that has like starts on this, like these two, two right next to each other, here it happens and it happens in shape number two. That means that you probably have a shape that has both a minor component to it and a major component to it. And that also means that you're at like the box. Here's the box right here. Here's the box right here. You're within the box. Half of the box is the top string, either the bottom half or the top half of the box when we get to our shapes. And why does that happen? Because we broke the guitar fretboard into five shapes, which makes sense because that fits our four to five finger because it ends up with four to five finger fret positions. But 
the but there's seven modes. That means that one sh we're going to have a couple shapes that are going to have to encompass more than one mode, and that happens in the shapes that start with this box shape because then you, the first note, if you start on the first note, it would be the minor mode of the Phrygian, and if you start on the second note, in this case, it would be then uh, the the second note is going to be the Lydian. So so this so I would call this shape either shape number four or the note number one Phrygian or note number two of the shape for a Lydian shape. This one, by the way, you don't have as much of a problem with because it's the major mode and you might call that like an E shape over here because that's your E major bar chord. And the reason you don't have much of a problem is because the B is the Lydian and we don't normally play in Lydian. We kind of ignore it as though, oh yeah, there's a B in front of it. But the same thing is the case. It's either the second note major scale or it's the first note. Uh, uh, did I say Lydian? I meant to say uh, Locrian, the first note Locrian, the other L one, the crazy L one though. The, okay. All right. So that's going to be that one. All right. And then, uh, so then I'm going to break inside of these shapes. I'm going to further break them down into the two analogies, which is going to be what I call the seven note house analogy, and then the five note or pentatonic barbell hamburger analogy. So within the seven note analogy, you've got the box here. This is important because if you can see these shapes, then and then list out what the relative positions of the modes are to that shape, you can orientate yourself on the neck not only in the key that we are looking at, but also in the key of any other key. If I switch to the key of G and all the related modes, everything would shift up, but the relationships would all be the same, just like an Excel worksheet here, right? If I shift everything up, if I shift everything up, everything's the same, right? It's just like a spreadsheet, right? It's just a spreadsheet that we have. On the, so the related positions will all be the same, which is great. So that means that I don't, I, it's cool to learn the actual notes that are in each of the scales, but it's more useful on the guitar oftentimes to learn the relative positions, given the fact that the scale shapes are all the same. So if you, so if we learn all of these shapes and we can then, and we can then name them by relative position and mode, absolute mode numbers, then that gives us the most flexibility to move to a different shape. It's not, it's still not easy to move to a different shape. I'm not saying I'm an expert at it myself, right? I can't play, I can't just easily play from a G to, a, to an A to a B to a C and just shift my fingering up. But theoretically you could, actually tactilely with your fingers, your fingers are still gonna be like, well, wait a sec, I'm still using these dots to orientate myself and so on and so forth. But, but you know, that's what we practice once we get the theory down, right? So, but in any case, that's why we're practicing labeling everything by the intervals and the shapes. It's more, it's more movable. Okay, and so then, so, so then, so we have, this is the house shape. Now, if I use this shape, I have what I have here is what I would call a five stringed instru instrument, the guitar, plus an added E string. So that means that I can break the shapes into the seven note shape is a two string, two string, and then a one string shape, meaning you've got the box, which is going to be broken out into two strings. You've got the box double stop, two strings, and then you've got the one string, which I would call the flat. So, and then if you want to convert the seven note shape into a five note pentatonic, you can take your box and you just remove the upper left and bottom right. You keep the upper right and bottom left. And that is a way that you can visualize converting from a seven note shape to the five note, a five note pentatonic shape. The other analogy is what I call the hamburger barbell analogy which is how people usually see the pentatonic shape. And that, in that way, people usually break out the strings in, of five strings into a, a two string, three string shape, right? And that two, the two string shape is what I call the barbell. 
where you only play the outside of the barbells. You've got the heavy hitters on the minors over here, which is going to be the Phrygian and the Aeolian or minor scale. Heavy hitters on the major, on the weights on the right side, which is the uh, Mixolydian and the major. And in the middle, those are removed in the pentatonic. That's the Lydian and the Locrian and would have to therefore be added if we wanted to move from a pentatonic shape to a major shape. So if you see the fretboard from a caged system, you probably want to be looking at it from a pentatonic five note shape in order to orientate yourself to be able to call this shape a C shape because the C will fit uniquely into the pentatonic shape and then add, and then you can always just add these two notes to convert it to the seven note shape. In terms of the hamburger, it's shifted up because of the fault line here. So here's the hamburger. It's just gonna have like these, the two sides here. And then if I wanted to convert it from a five note to a seven note, I imagine putting a ball cap, baseball cap on top so that I have the bill up here and then if I have the added weight up here, I'm going to imagine that I need another bit to the base down here. So you put a, a, a bit on the top of the hamburger bun and a little bit back on the back bottom of the hamburger bun. All right, those are the analogies. Now, before we walk through the scale uh, again, and again, I'm going to be walking through the bottom of the scale this time because we went through the top last time, even though I didn't go in reverse. But I want to work down here because that allows me to go over the fault line which is where all the shapes differ because of that fault line. Uh, and so we'll take a look at that. But just to break things up a bit, let's imagine the shapes, the different shapes. Now that I have these boxes, I want to start to integrate like, OK, how can I see the shape in different ways? So remember the rules of this shape, the rules of this breaking the thing up into five shapes, the fretboard, the thing, the fretboard into five shapes is that I'm going to have I'm going to break everything up in, uh, I only reach up to four strings apart, which usually means that I play three notes a string, but I'm never going to reach five notes away. So I'm never going to span five notes. I'm never going to make my pinky reach up to five notes. So that means like in this shape, you get three notes and then you go up here, you go up here and you get three notes. And then you go here and you get three notes, but then you go here and you only get two notes. The third note is out here. It's right there. I could reach it, but I'm not going to because the rule is I'm not going to span five frets on any one string. And because there's a whole step between both of these and not a whole half step, that means instead of reaching to this B, I reach down here, which means it's not pulling me forward, but taking me back this way, right? And that keeps me kind of in this column. But I could have reached up here, right? And if I can imagine, well, what would happen if I reached up there? Well, that would be the three note per string shape. So, and then I can also imagine, well, what if I only went two strings up? Then if I went from like this E to F, and I'm in the key of uh, the Phrygian in this case, I went from this E to F, instead of going to that G, I go to this G. Well, what would happen? Well, that's going to make me lean backwards. So, so that's going to make me drift this way across uh, the fretboard can totally do that G to A. And then instead of going to this B, I'm going to go to this B, right? And so, so I think those are useful ways to kind of see the fretboard to, to realize that it's not like you have to see the fretboard just this way or only one way, because if you see it only this way, that's fine, but you're always going to be making chords that are going to be based off of the bar chords leaning forward. You're not going to be thinking so much about like the lean back chords which are actually pretty easy to see once you start kind of messing with them and could open up the fretboard a little bit, right? So a lot of people talk about, well, I'm stuck in the box. I don't like being stuck in the box. Well, how do you break out of the box? Well, you realize the fact that this is probably the most efficient way to play the scale in one position and the most efficient way to build chords that have more than like two to three strings in them because there's less stretchiness. But the stretchiness can be useful because then you can build more complex chord with different interval structures in it. And, and so it's good to see it other ways too. So what are the other ways we can see it? 
Well, this is the lean back method. So let's just run through this fairly quickly just to get a, a sense of saying, how can I come up with these different patterns? Well, I've got the fretboard still mapped out here just in terms of the key I'm in, which is the key of C and the related modes. And uh, in this case, I have, by the way, the, the one is green, the three and the five are, are red and yellow respectively, uh, because that's what makes the major uh, the, 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 the C major chord. But let's see what happens if I, I just apply the rule of two notes per string. And so I'm going to say, okay, what, what would that do? So if I'm on the key of C, then notice how do I orientate this to what I've been learning? Well, it's still on the key of C. That means it's still, if I see that box, I'm still starting on the second of the box. It's still the same starting point. It's still in the penthouse in our house analogy, looking towards the ocean up here. And then I reach up to the D, and instead of then going to the E out here, I'm going to go back. Notice this is the same as what I would call shape number two, because here's shape number two right here, the orange. That's shape number two. So what do we do on shape number two? We start on the second note of the shape, and then we go up, and then we go back one. So we haven't really deviated from shape number two as of yet. Let's copy, let's copy this one and paste it here so now we're we're still on shape number basically shape two here and then i go and then i go from e to f but then shape shape number two would typically bring us up to this g right because i'd have three notes per string and i haven't violated the rule of spanning over four frets so i would go there but i'm not going to because my new rule is only two notes per string so instead of going there, I'm going to go back uh, to this one. So we go back to the G. Now that, of course, takes us out of what I would call the shape number two. And now we're, we're basically moved back to uh, this shape, which is basically shape number one. I would call this you know, shape number one. So it's taking us across the fault line or across the, the boxes. And then we go to the A. And instead of reaching up to this B, which we wouldn't do in either condition, if I'm in, if I'm in shape number one, I wouldn't reach up here anyways. This would be the two note per string hamburger shape in that shape. So I'm still, I would still follow the rules under both shapes to move down here and then boom, boom. But if I was in shape number one, I would reach up to this D now, but I'm not gonna do that here because I'm just doing two notes per string, which moves me back so now I'm moving back to here and now I'm in uh, what I would call shape number five, shape number uh, five, and then boom, boom, and then boom, boom. So that's, and so a lot of times I, right now I'm basically visualizing this as though I'm making like uh, a chord based on the top string. So if I started on the C, I'd have a one, three, five. So I'd have this lean back shape, one, three, five. And then the second chord, which is the two, is, is gonna be a minor chord. So that means I'm gonna have one, three, five, which is the one, three, five, which is gonna be the third now is back here. And then I can connect those two together. Now I could keep going. It's the five, and then if I had more fingers, I can reach down here to the seven, and this would be the nine, otherwise known as the two, right? And then, and then this would be the 11, uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise known as the five. Uh, so you could keep it going, but, but if I just think of those two together, it's just kind of interesting that I could go from the one of chord number one to the one of chord number two to the three of chord number one, to the three of chord number two, to the five of chord number one, to the five of chord number two, and that makes my scale because I have C, D, E, F, G, A, and then I should go down here to B, C to end it, right? So that's kind of interesting. So if I could see that, I could start to put those together. So do, 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 do. And then I can always end it with my chord. So if I started on the, if I, so I can end it with my chord there, right? I can go. And then, 
and then I'm reaching back up to my chord. So I've been kind of messing with that. And then, and we could go the other way, of course, too, which is a little wonky, because now you're starting on, the, on this one, the second. So sometimes I like to do it a couple times, like... So then, and what's kind of neat about this again is that that's in the key of C. If I move it up and I do the same thing to the next one, then I'm on the D and the, the note two is the Dorian. So, so all these shapes start on what you would expect on the note you would expect. That's the D, that's note number two in my scale. Therefore, it's going to be the Dorian. And so the same thing happens. I can say, well, if I'm up here, where, where am I? Well, normally the Dorian that would be the Dorian shape, right? It would be the Dorian shape, which what I what, what I would call shape uh, number uh, shape number three uh, shape, and uh, you might also call it like a C shape from the caged system. And so so, and then I'm going to go from the D to the E. But then, if I was doing my my normal rules, I would come up to this F because that's not violating the three note. Uh, the only four string span but on the two notes per string i'm going to move back here so now i'm going now i'm going okay now i'm going back here so now i'm basically within what i would call shape number two uh shape number two here and i go boom boom to the g and then we're going to go back uh to the a and i'm still in what i would call uh, shape number two and then we go boom boom and then and then I would go up here under our normal rules but no this time I'm going back to this C so now I'm in what I would call shape number uh, shape number one shape number one boom boom and then back to here still in shape number one boom boom and then that takes me back here instead of up here and that so that so if I but if I just think about the top two again I can build this this D which is a minor lean back chord and then I can build this E which is also that's the Phrygian now it's a minor chord so I have the one three five so these are symmetrical shapes now because they're both minors that because it's the two and the three of the related major so the two and the three modes, if you want to think about it that way. So it has the one, three, five, one, three, five. So if I put them together, I've got D, E, F, G, A, B, and they're all spaced apart uh, with one note in between because they're symmetrical shapes, right? So I could say, okay, one, two. So if I was to play this, the scale in the key of D, Dorian, It'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Did I do that right? I think I did. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then maybe I slide up here. D. Why did it work over here? If over here I said one, two, three, four, five, six, and that was in my C, C, D, E, F, G, A. And this is D, E, F, G. Why doesn't it leave me? So I've been messing it up here. Sorry about that. What am I doing? It's going to go D, E, F, D, E, F, G, A, B. There we go. I was going back to this G. Sorry about that. And I was like, what am I? Well, that doesn't work. And then I end off. All right. So there we go. So D, E, F, G, 
Wait a sec. G, E, F, G, A, B, and then, and then here's my D, E, D, F, A, D, F, A, D. So then if I put this one together with what we did before, I can go D, E, F, G, A, B, and then do the C one. C, D, E, F, G, A. Right, and so then I could go, all right, sorry, I kind of messed that one up. Let's go to the next one and say, let's do it for uh, this one. So now I'm on the F, which would be up here. So F would be way up here. That's a little bit high to kind of play through. So I'm just going to kind of visualize that and realize that I could move that over here. But if I start on that F, that would be in the Phrygian, right? I would be in uh, the Phrygian mode, which makes sense. And I would be putting together a, a, uh, a, a minor uh, F, or I'm sorry, if I played from the, from the E, it would be Phrygian. And then I would be playing a minor E and then a major F. And then if I go to the next one, Lydian. So, so now the Lydian is, is over here, which is way up on the 15th, but can start be, to be seen on this side because there's our G. Still a little tight to play that lean back shape when you're playing in, in the key of C and related modes. So the next one, I think, is the first one that becomes a little bit more practical. Now we're on the Mixolydian where I have my G. So now I can say, okay, so the, the Mixolydian would go G, A, B, C, D, E, right? And so that's leaning back. This is our normal G, leaning back, and then the A minor. And then I can put those together. So if I put if I put those together, and then I've got, and then I've got the A. Let's go to the A. So if I put the A, that's going to be the. Now I'm on the mode six, which is the A minor. So I now I have an A minor that looks like this, and then I have a B, which is the funny one, which is the Locrian, which looks like this. Boom! If I lean it back. So if I put that one together it goes and then and then the B if I go to the B one this is actually Locrian it goes and I gotta reach up to that that one so if I put those shapes together and I, I'm gonna imagine I'm in the key of A and then I kind of put these together. I can go. And then do it for the maybe the key of D. So here's my D shape, D to E. To C. I think that's kind of an interesting I've been playing with that shape so I'm gonna keep practicing that so then if we know if we look at the three notes per string we have a similar kind of thing now so now I, I'm starting on the key of C again where I see the box right here so there's my box I still start in the same spot which is the top of uh, the box the penthouse of the box and then I lean forward just like I would in position two like right here position number two but now instead of going back like I normally would in position number two because this string would violate my only four four strings in a row shape this time I have three notes per string whether it's four strings away or five strings away therefore I'm reaching up to duh, duh, duh. so that shape 
Now, now this is an interesting one because I'm actually starting in the middle of what I'm calling the three pillars, which you can actually see starts on the key of G. So when you play Mixolydian, as we'll see, that actually starts on the top of the three pillars. So that's that shape. And the middle bit would be right here. That middle shape is where I'm starting when I'm in the major mode. So then we go, okay. So I'm gonna go do do do, And then that E means that I don't have to reach back to this E. So I'm in the middle of the box now. And then I'm at the bottom of what I call the three pillar shape. Do do do. Bop, bop, bop. And then it naturally moves up even though we're not in the kink of the tuning or the fault line uh, to to the the B. So now we're at. And so now notice now where we're at, we're naturally at the the uh, the house double stop shape. This time we're playing the whole house instead of just the first half of it. And so we go boom, 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 boom. And then the bottom boom, boom, boom. And then it's going to move up. This time, because of the fault line, it would not have moved up if not for the fault line. And now we have our familiar shape, which is the double stop box, which we don't need to alter because all three notes are within that shape. Okay, so, so notice we haven't gone full circle around the shape because we haven't yet seen the top, which was the G bit of the the three pillars shape. So this shape that we're using has three strings grouped together and then two strings with the with the house double stop and then two strings with the double stop house. So it actually has two, four, five, six, seven strings and what you could think of as a five stringed instrument with an added E string to it, right? So what do I mean by that? I could say, well, this, this E right here uh, this bottom D to, to F repeats. So now I'm going to go back up to the top repeating, which I could think of as though we're continuing on in the key of C, but instead I'm now going to switch my mind and say that now I'm playing in the Dorian. So now I'm playing in the Dorian mode and I'm just going to go, okay, so if I play in the Dorian, I'm just going to start on note number two of the scale, which would be right there and apply my three note per string rule. Where am I in terms of my normal shapes? I would be in the Dorian shape, in the five note breakout shape, or and that would be uh, shape number three. You might call it a D shape for, uh, with regards to uh, the, the, you might call it, yeah, D shape with the pentatonic shapes. So it goes boom, boom, boom. So I'm still in the same shape, no difference, because that's three notes per string and I haven't spanned across uh, uh, more than four frets. So I go back just like I normally would. Boom, boom. But now I'm, I'm instead of going, going back here, I have to, I'm going to go out here. I would not go there in shape number three normally because it's, it's spanning more than four frets, but this time I'm going out there. Boom. And that means that I don't have to go back to this B. And so now I'm once again in the middle of the, the, the house you can see that's what the difference in the shape is i'm cutting the house in half sometimes right so now the house i'm only in the middle of the house and now i'm in what i would call again the three pillar shape notice i'm in the middle of the three pillar shape which is where the starting point is if i thought of myself as the key of c rolling through it all the way through it and then starting again to here i wouldn't get back to the circle completing until i get to this shape but instead of thinking it of the circle completing going through here to here, I'm thinking of it as starting in the Dorian mode, starting in the key of D, right? The Dorian D. So then that's going to go here. So now I'm in the middle of the three pillars. Duh, duh, duh. And now I'm in the bottom of the three pillars. Duh, duh, duh. And, then, uh, and then normally when I get to the bottom of the three pillars, as we saw before, it moves back. But, I don't, but now that moving back got shifted up because I'm in the fault line. So now I go, go up the fault line, which normally would be moved up. I'm sorry, normally it's moved up. <laughs> and it does move up, but it moves up twice because once again, I'm in the fault line and it moves up normally up, up because that's the way the shape works. So now we have to move all the way, all the way up. 
uh, to get to the to the B. Du, du, du. And now I'm on the box, uh, the box double stop. Okay, so if we continue this, now I can take this E F G, and I'm gonna move it to the to the first fret because it's easier to see. So if I if I went to E F G, and I copy and paste it, and then it repeats over here, we could imagine that we're continuing on as if we did this long stretch in the key of C or in the Dorian, the D, but now we're gonna reimagine it as though we're now in the Phrygian, the third mode, and we're starting on the E. So if we start on the E, this would, this would be in what I would call shape number four, typically. That's the shape we're currently working on, right? And it would go boom, boom, boom. No difference between the two shapes because there's three strings that don't span beyond five, four frets. So then boom, 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 still no difference. And then boom, 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 still no difference. We're still just in shape number four under either the three note per string or just shape number four rules. But then boom, 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 we go out to this B instead of back here, which we normally would because we're spanning more than four frets. But on the three notes per string, we're gonna pick out this one out here. This, by the way, this of course is our three pillar shape which has been shifted due to the fault line. So we're still in, now we're in our G, which is our three pillar shape, but now it has to move up here because of the fault line. Boom, boom, boom. And then boom, boom, boom. Okay, so then we're gonna, this bottom bit, the F is, is gonna move to here. So now I can imagine we're on this F as though we're, we're moving around. We could imagine it as though this whole thing was in the key of C and we just keep on going around and around the circle but we're going to switch our thought process to now say I'm going to start from that F, which means I would be in the Lydian mode. So the Lydian mode would be here. Now, if I was in my normal system, this would be like, like uh, the, the, the Lydian, this would, this would be shape number four that I would be in starting on the Lydian component of shape number four. And uh, it goes boom, boom, which is normal, but then I would normally go back here in shape number four, but I need a three note per string, so I'm reaching up here. So that pulls me forward. That's the bottom of the pillar shape. Naturally, when we end the bottom of the pillar shape, we shift up a string, and now we're in the box, uh, the, the, the house hamburger, and we're now squarely in uh, what I would call shape number five, shape number five from the five shape system and goes boom 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 still in shape number five because that doesn't violate our rules on either shape and then boom 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 still in shape number five and then we shift up because of the so this is the double stop box shape which has simply been shifted up due to uh the fault line and i think that's actually the same in both shapes and then we move down here. So that's gonna be that. Now the next one, if I take this G, dot, 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 it's going out to here, then that repeats, and this is going to, this is going too far, it should be out to there. That repeats down here. And now, so now we're on the Mixolydian. So the Mixolydian is interesting because it actually starts on the three pillars. So that means if I start on the G, if I was in Mixolydian in the related mode to the key of C, then I not only have the two, as we saw with the key of C, right? Like if I was on the major scale, I had like those two shapes, but in the key of G, that actually spans three out. So now I've got, because now I'm in the Mixolydian and I'm at the top of the three pillars shape. So, so that's kind of interesting. If you like that stretchiness shape, or you can think of it as two kind of like hamburger shapes side by side, then that's an interesting way to visualize the fretboard that might open things up a bit. So you've got the three note per string, three note per string, the, 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 and, and then it's gonna move up to the, the uh, square double stop and then, and then to the double stop square. Okay, I'm gonna stop it there. Maybe we'll return to this later, but I kind of think I've spent too much time on it. Let's go back to this one. And so now I'm gonna do, we're gonna do our intervals. Uh, before we do, let's do a joke. 
break things up here. This is more like a long rant, so I have to get some coffee for this one. All right. Honestly, the new like Rings of Power series, which is supposed to be based on like the J.R. Tolkien Lord of the Rings, you know, films and whatnot and books, it's horrible. Yeah, it, it's it's as though that fire demon, like the Belrog, you know, the Belrog, it's like it's like the Belrog sat on the entire Middle Earth for crying out loud. And and then all of Middle Earth cried out in fiery, agonizing voice as one claiming Goodness gracious, great balls of fire, right? Because the bell rock sat on him, and then, and then, and then, before being snuffed out of existence, you know, seriously. So how is Holly, how is it that Hollywood keeps taking like the most valuable IPs, the most valuable intellectual property that any idiot could make money on them, and then they, and then they turn it into crap? How is it they keep doing that, man? Yeah, and then. Pe- you know what people do when you ask that? They say, well, because it's capitalism, dude. It's capitalism that messed up the movies. But but th- this behavior is not capitalistic, okay? This is like, this is not... Hollywood s- s- seems to have a very generic production roadmap that mo- it looks more like a Soviet Union-type shoe factory producing, you know, th- millions of pairs of two left shoes which fall apart on impact with water. Seriously, I mean, it's amazing. That's not what happens in a capitalistic system. I mean, you, dude, you could hire a YouTuber to write a better script than, than, than what we, we repeatedly get what is happening. You know, a script that, you know, it actually aligns with the actual universe that you're writing for. That's what the point, that's what you're trying to do. When Honestly, like, like, if, if you fail with an intellectual property like Tolkien's Lord of the Rings or Star Wars or Marvel, you know, that's on you. You know, that's on, that's ridiculous. That's like, dude, that's like a, that's like a basketball team being stacked with like a in their prime player, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Larry Bird, all on the same team, all in their prime and still losing to like, to like a high school special needs girls team for crying out loud i'm talking like a like a high school special needs girls team that do, that doesn't even have any troons on it you know for, that you know what i'm talking about i mean it shouldn't happen that's that's not capitalism that's like that's having everything you could possibly need to win and still somehow being a loser that's what that is that's what that is it's like oh it's capitalism that's why it's so uh, dude no, it's not. They're they're losing money. Do you? Ca, 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 capitalists like to make money, often by making stuff that's actually good. You know, stuff that people actually like. Stuff after which people buy. You don't feel like you just got scammed. You feel you don't feel dirty afterwards because you feel like, you know, scams are a short-term grift, which can make money, uh, but 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 but. But they're not actually a business, right? A scam isn't a business. If 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 they made like one movie that was that was really cheap and bad, and and then slapped a Tolkien label on it or something like that, that would be a scam. Making money in the short run, cashing in their goodwill, their good brand name recognition in the long run. So it's short run profits off of long run reputation damage. So I get that, but that but but. But, but look, making show after show, movie after movie, that's not actually cheap, but really, really expensive crap that kills the brand name and loses money, that's, that's not smart business. That's not even a smart scam. That's ridiculous. And, and plus, you know, like a, a scammer can only sell you a, pip, a piss popsicle one time right by calling it like lemon flavored or something but but that's it right then they're, then you're done because your rep your your goodwill is gone your reputation's lost your brand is destroyed i mean seriously <laughs> turning the work of the most painstakingly well-crafted fantasy universe 
from a war veteran professor who basically single-handedly created the fantasy genre that so many of us enjoy into like a modern day moral ambiguity, everything is morally gray soap opera. I mean, it's beyond sad. So how, how do you take the well, the, uh, how do you take the most well-crafted universe ever and treat it and treat it as though you're slapping together like episodes of the Muppets, you know, you know, call me what you will, but this, this kind of, per, this kind of performance deserves to be mocked, dang it, mocked ruthlessly. And, and, and to the many YouTubers building their YouTube career doing just that, I say, good luck and God bless them. So it's, 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 it's not the good people of Middle Earth that the deserve to be smothered by a fire bell rock demon thing. It's the creators of this abomination that repeatedly keep doing the same damn thing just like a Soviet shoe production factory that produces shoes that fall apart on impact with water. Those are the ones that should be screaming in terror. Goodness gracious, great balls of fire. All right, anyway, that was kind of a long rant. Sorry about that, sorry about that. I'm back, I'm back. We're going, now we're going around the horn this time. So we're going A to A, A to A. So we're gonna go around this way, and then go around to the top. Ooh, what happened there? All right, so we'll say, let's do, 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 let's just do the, our exercise, the normal routine. So now we're gonna be in the the A's. Where, where, am, I, where am I at here? So once again, I'm in what I would call shape number four, which is the Phrygian shape. If I know that that's the uh, the Phrygian, then I could say, well, the Phrygian is the third of the related major, and I want to get to the sixth of the related major, which is the minor mode, Aeolian mode, the sixth mode. So I could do that by saying this is going to be uh, that's if that's the if that's the uh, the Phrygian or three. Three, four, five, six gets me to the A, and I know the octave of the A is here. So I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to let's move from this A then, and this shape around uh, around the shape. So where am I at on this A? Well, it's the minor. Where does the minor live? It's not in the house in the seven note house analogy, but instead it's in the flat on the right side of the flat. Where is it in the hamburger analogy? It's in the hamburger in the meat of the hamburger. So there's where we start. All right, let's just move it. Let's just go to the to the interval. So if I go to the second, uh, which is going to be here. So we're going to say from here to here. So now the second is going to be a two note away major second. So two note away major second because we're in the minor mode. How do I know it's a two note away major second? Because I could see from here to here. That's the fault line. So that's going to be uh, five. And then, and then four, three, two. So that gets me to the uh, two note away major second. So when I see that shape, it looks like it should be another string back because usually it's pinky to pointer, but because of the fault line, that's gonna be our two note away major second. It looks like it should be a three note away minor third, but no, two note away uh, major second, okay? And then uh, the second also of mode number six, Aeolian, is if that's the sixth mode, how is it the sixth mode? Because we're measuring it off the major scale, otherwise known as Ionian. If Ionian is the first, the Aeolian is the sixth of it. And to get from one, if I'm on step one to step six, I have to go up five steps. So that means the formula will be six minus one is the five steps to get to the Aeolian from the, the major scale, uh, Aeolian from Ionian, <laughs> and plus two, this, which is because I'm on the second, which would be five, six, seven, gives me the seventh. And I know the seventh of the relative major scale is the one that I would make the diminished chord from that most people kind of generally stay away from, otherwise known as the Locrian mode. So if I see that B in, you know, I'm gonna, and I call it the second, in terms of the minor mode, that's the one that, I, that I'm kind of scared to build a chord off of a little bit because it has the minor third, but also the flat fifth on it. Uh, okay, 
let's go to the next one. We're going to say the next one is going to be the third of mode number uh, six Aeolian is, of course, a minor third. The minor third defines it as a minor mode. It looks like it's a major third when I just look at that shape. But because of the kink in the tuning, it's a minor third here. How do I know that? Because if I count up to here, that would be five, four, three, three note away minor third. The inverse is 12 minus three, which is nine, nine note away major six. So if I see that shape because of the kink in the tuning, I have, to, I have to be able to say that's not a major third, it's a minor third, and the inverse therefore from bottom to top is a nine note away major sixth. The inverse of a minor is typically a major. The third of mode number six Aeolian is six minus one or five plus three, five, six, seven, eight. There's only seven modes, eight minus seven is one, giving me mode number one Ionian, otherwise known as the major scale. Therefore, if I see the third of a minor key, I know that I actually build a major chord off it because in the major chords I, scale, I know that the one, three, five are major. So that means that the third of the Aeolian will be a major. Beyond that, I know all the intervals not related to the A minor that I'm in, but related to the C will be the same as a major scale and will all fit into the key that I'm in, which is the Aeolian mode. All right. And I also know that where does the where does the major live? It lives in the house in the house analogy at the top of the house penthouse looking towards the ocean top right of the house. And in the uh, hamburger barbell analogy, you can see it's at the bottom of the hamburger is where we are here. Here's the hamburger without the shift in the in the in the in the earth fault line zone. There it is. All right, let's go to the next one. Otra vez, por favor. The fourth of Aeolian is going to be here. That's going to be a a five note away uh, perfect fourth for the minor scale Aeolian. It looks like it's a flat fifth or augmented fourth because normally the fourth is right underneath it. So I have to say because of that fault line, it's different, which drives everyone crazy. But that's the way it is. Dang, earthquakes will drive you crazy. That's what they do. So we're going to say, that, how do I know that? Because I could say that from here to here, it's five notes away. That's going to be a perfect fourth. 12 minus five is a seven note away perfect fifth. Therefore, seeing that shape top to bottom, five note away perfect fourth. Bottom to top, seven note away perfect fifth. Where... Uh, the fourth of mode number six Aeolian is six minus one, which is five plus four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, minus only seven modes is two. So it would be the second of the related major scale, which means that I know I'm going to make a minor chord off of the fourth of the Aeolian because it's equivalent to the second of the major and the two, three, six of the majors are what I make minor chords on. Beyond that, if I know that the second is absolute mode number two, Dorian, I can go beyond just making the one, three, five and do all of the intervals not related to the A, but related to the D, including the distinctive Dorian interval different than the minor interval of the major sixth instead of a minor six. And so, and it'll still fit in the key that I'm in, which is Aeolian. Okay. And where does it live? Well, it's the minor mode. It's not in the house, in the house analogy. It's doing its own thing over here in the double stop. And in terms of the hamburger analogy, it actually encompasses the entire hamburger, top left of the hamburger to the bottom right of the hamburger. That's where the Dorian starting points are. Let's go to the next one. That's going to be then the fifth uh, of the fifth of, uh, of mode number uh, six Aeolian. It's going to be boom, boom. It's going to be a... a uh, uh, the fifth is going to be a seven note away perfect fifth. How do I know? Because if I count up here, there'd be five because of the fault line. Ten, nine, eight, seven. You would think it would be back another shape because that's normally how the shape is, but it crossed the fault line. The fault line isn't between these two strings. It's between these two strings. But because my notes are still going across that fault line, it shifts up my shape. So it looks like 
it doesn't look exactly like you would think to, to, to get the fifth. It would be back when. Okay. So, uh, then, uh, what else do I, do I want to say about that then? Uh, I can count that up by saying it's 5, 10, 9, 8, 7, inverse 12 minus 7 is 5. Inverse would be a 5 note away perfect 4. So if I see that shape top to bottom, 7 note away perfect 5th, bottom to top, 5 note away perfect 4th. The 5th of mode number 6, Aeolian, is 6 minus 1 is 4 plus 5. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 minus only 7 modes is 3. So it would be the 3rd of the related major scale, which means that the 5th, of the aeolian would be a minor chord construction because it's the third of the related major scale and i know that the two three six of the related major is what i make minor chords on beyond that i know that i'm on the phrygian mode if i know that the third mode absolute mode number three is a phrygian then i also know that all the intervals related to this e not related to that a but related to the e that that are of the phrygian will work not just the minor third but the distinctive minor second which is that f so i can throw that f in there and it would still be in the key of mode number six aeolian if i realize that i'm on the related phrygian mode and i build my skill off the phrygian mode with a minor second in it Whew. okay so where does the phrygian live well it's in the house it's in the basement bottom left basement of the house uh, analogy and the barbell analogy, it's at the top of the barbell on the left-hand side where the, where the miners live, okay? Let's go to the next one. We're going to go to the sixth. So we're on the sixth, uh, which is here. So now we have the sixth of the minor scale is an eight note away minor sixth. Notice that you would think it would be uh, shifted because, again, it's off it's off by basically a, a note here because of the fault line between these two, between these two, not between these two. So we have an eight note away minor six. So it, look, it looks kind of like a major six, but now it's a, it's a minor six. because Okay, so then, so, so then that means the inverse would be, and how do I know that? Well, I can count up. So it would be five, 10, nine, eight. And the inverse would be 12 minus 8, which would be 4. So if I go top to bottom, that's going to be an 8 note away minor 6. Bottom to top, 4 note away uh, major 3rd. All right, let's go to the next one. And then we're going to go boom. That's going to be the 7th. So now we've got this A to that one. So now the 7th of a minor scale is a 10 note away minor 7. And if, and, and if I look at this shape, I would say, hey, the minor seven should be back here, but no, it's shifted up because of the fault, the fault line. And how do I know that? I can count up, it'd be five, 10, and inverse 12 minus 10 is two, two note away major second. So if I play this top to bottom, 10 note away minor seven, to bottom to top, uh, two note away major second, okay. And then the seventh of mode number six, Aeolian, is six minus one, which is five plus seven, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve minus only seven modes gives us five, which is the mixolydian, or I know that the fifth of the related major scale is a major chord. Therefore, the seventh of the minor scale is going to be a major chord construction because I know it's related to the fifth of the relative major and the one, four, five are major chord constructions. Beyond that, I know that the fifth, the fifth mode is mixolydian. So I can build my intervals around that G if I wanted to build a chord that includes all of the major intervals, but also the minor seventh related to this G would still be in the same key as the key of A minor that I'm in. All right, let's do the same thing from the top here. This repeats up top. So remember the shape here repeats to the top, this time comparing it not to this A, but to this A. So I'm comparing from bottom to top, which is kind of usually reversed or inverted, and we're going across an octave, which can be a little bit difficult sometimes to think. I'm going back to the E, so we're back to the E. So I'm looking at this A here compared to this E up top. What is that? 
Well, I know it's an it's the E, which is the fifth. So that means it's going to be a seven note away perfect fifth. How do I know that? Well, first I would count from the from the E to the bottom. Typically, I could count to this one. This would just be five notes away. So I know right there it's a five note away perfect fourth, right? But I can also go five, ten. 15, 16, 17, 17 minus only 12 notes is basically seven minus two, seven, six, five. That's a five note away, perfect uh, fourth. So top to bottom, five note away, perfect fourth, which means that the bottom to top is 12 minus five or seven note away, perfect fifth, which I also just know because I know that the perfects are inverts of each other. So if it's a perfect fourth, the inverse must be a perfect fifth. All right, so then I'm going to go to this one and say, so, and say, okay, this one from here to here, what is that? That's going to be the sixth, which I know is an eight note away minor six. How do I know that? Well, if I compare this way, it would be five. And then I could go back here to four, which would be a four note away perfect fourth. But if I keep going five, 10, 15, 16, 16 minus 12 notes is six minus two, which is four. So I know from top to bottom, that's gonna be a four note away major third, which means from bottom to top is 12 minus four or eight note away minor six. And then if I go to uh, the next one, we're gonna go then to this one. That is of course gonna be our G. So it's hard to reach here. And that's gonna be this one. And that's going to be our uh, seven note away or 10 note away minor seven, 10 note away minor seven. And how do I know that? Because I could go five, this would be five, uh, four, three, two, or five, 10, 15, 14, 14 minus 12 is four minus two, two, four minus two is two. So top to bottom, this would be a two note away major second that means bottom to top 12 minus 2 is a 10 note away uh minor 7. all right hopefully i i did that properly i should go back the other way but i'm kind of tired on doing that so let's try looking at our uh chord so here's a list of all of our chords these are all combinations using one and then all the combinations of of between one and seven if I start on a one and have only three chords. So one, all the twos, three, four, five. And so, and so this is an attempt for me to try to put together something where I could, I could not just randomly choose things out of the air because I don't choose things randomly. I don't think we do things randomly that way, but rather just list them out and then I can play with them instead of spending all my in mental energy trying to think about how I can randomly choose something out of the air. Right? So I'm going to say then I'm so let's say we did the one, two, three, I'm start with the one, two, three again. So I'm in the key of the minor. So let's say that we're going to say we want to be in a one, two, three, in the key of a minor, well, the one's going to be an a minor. So I know that. And then the two, well, what is the two? Well, I know it's gonna be uh, A, B, so I know it's gonna be a B, and I, I'm not dealing with the sharps and flats because I'm in the related key to the C, so I'm gonna say, all right, well, that's the, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be a B, and then I'm gonna say, well, uh, uh, is it a major or minor thing that I'm going to be playing? If I don't know, I'd have to say, well, uh, if I do my, my, my little math, I know that the Aeolian is the sixth mode, minus one is five, plus two is seven, and then I say, oh no, it's the seventh of the C, of, of a major scale, which is the diminished chord, right? And so it's the Locrian, so I probably shouldn't have picked that one, but there's the Locrian, and then the three, uh, so I have to play a diminished chord, which has a minor third and a flat fifth, and then the third, is going to be then then what is the third of a minor key well again if i didn't know i can say well the six minus one is five plus three is five six seven eight minus only seven modes is one it's the first of the relative major therefore a major chord would be constructed beyond that 
it's the first mode or the major scale. So all of the intervals for a major would would kind of work on that one. So this would be a kind of, and then here's the actual notes over here that are in the in the chord. So this would be a kind of a difficult one to do because I'd have to go from like an A to a B diminished, something like that. To, to then a C. So that's gonna be pretty difficult to make it sound like the A is the is is the root a little bit right because because I'm starting on the A and then I'm doing a leading tone which is usually the key that you use to lead home relieving the tension to the C so it sounds like C is now the root but I'm trying to make it go back to the A is the root so let's see if we can play with it Let's, let's do something that doesn't have a diminished in it <laughs> to start off with. A little tired here. I had a long rant for crying out loud. What are you doing to me? This one has the t another two in it. Not, not the two. The four uh, has a Dorian. Let's try this one. So now we can go. So now we have the one which is of course the minor. The three is like, okay, A, B, C, it's gonna be a C, is it a major or minor? I can say, well, it's six, it's, so it's gonna, be, it's gonna be six minus one is five, plus three is eight minus one, that's our, that's our, uh, our one again, which is a major chord construction, and then the four, let's actually do this, let's go here. and then make this one outline green. So there's our Rasta, almost Rasta colors. And then the four is gonna be the Dorian because it's eight, it's six minus one is five plus four, uh, it's five, six, seven, eight, nine minus seven is two. That would be the Dorian uh, mode. I also know that I'm in the minor mode, which is useful to say that the one, four, five of the minor are your minor keys, but the majors are a little bit wonky because the two is actually Locrian, and that means the three, six, seven are major in the minor key. So it's kind of easier to memorize that. But anyways, we're gonna say the C. So we've got A, and then that nice easy switch from A to C, D minor.
try to make let's try to do a secondary dominant kind of thing. So let's say before we go on like that D minor, if I look at it and I take the fifth of it, which is an E, I could say I can make an E major or or add a seven to it, but let's or an E major or or a, a dominant seven on it, but a major would be good enough, right? And so instead of playing a D minor instead of playing uh, when I go into this D I'm gonna play an E major you know leading leading into it which is a little bit out of the key because it would be an E minor in our key but the E major has a leading tone that will make that D more of a destination possibly so let's say we played it like an A and then a C and then we played and then I'm gonna sneak in an E major here and then the D minor. Back to the A. A. C. E major. E minor. Wait a sec, I messed up here. I was I was using the, an E an E major that should lead into the <laughs> that should lead into the A. I'm like, that doesn't sound right. It should sorry about that. It should be if I'm looking at the D, the fifth of the D is here. Here's my power chord. The fifth, the fifth here is, is the is the A. So I'd have to play an A major to lead back into the D, which is kind of wonky, because I'm in the key of A minor. I don't know. Let's try that. Let's try it. I'm going to just do this again. Sorry about that. I'm going to say A minor, C major, and then I'm going to try to sneak in an A major in there, or maybe even an, an A dominant 7. Sounds out of whack. But it kind of leads into the D, and then to the A minor. A7, A dominant seven. Let's say, let's say if I was going in, if I wanted to go into this to the C, uh, the C has a fifth of a G. So let's sneak a G in before I go to that C, just to, and that'll be my leading tone to make the C a destination. So if I go from an A minor, and then I play a G just to lead into the C maybe a C7, dominant 7. D minor. A minor. G dominant 7. C. See the resolution there.
Let's play with another one. Let's go to do. Let's get the C out of there, and go to the four. The four is the D again, and then back. No, no two, and then the three. Let's go to the the five. The one four five uh, is going to be all the minors. So it's kind of the blue, the minor blues maneuver. So one four five. Uh, 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 so now I can go A. with a Phrygian. So notice if I want to make this E lead back to the A, uh, I could put, I could make it a major E, right? Or even a, a, se a, a, a dominant seven E. So if I go A, D, E minor, and then I add the E major, Back to the A. A minor, D minor, D minor, D major, A. What if I want to make the D the destination? So once again, the fifth of the D, if I can get this right this time, is an A. So that's kind of makes it tough for me to go from an A. I'm trying to be in the key of A. I switch to like an A7, an, an A major 7, or a dominant 7, to the D, minor, to the E minor, A, A minor, A major dominant 7, to lead into the Seven. To lead into the B, B, B minor, B major to lead into the A. Okay, what if I wanted to lead into the E? Well, the E, the fifth of the E, if I make a power chord, the fifth of the E is a B. So I could throw in a B major or B major dominant seven, let's say. So I could say that would be like here. So here's my B. I could do. Something like that. So I could say, okay, A minor. Seven to the E minor, E major to the A, A minor, D minor, B dominant seven it sounds wacky until I get back to the E, making the E the destination. E changes to E major. Destination to the A. A minor. D minor. Maybe just a B major this time. Doesn't sound quite as harsh, but should still be back to the E minor. D major. I don't know. Play more with that later.